So this is me, Patrick. I run a company called Obscura Digital here in San Francisco. And uh, <clears throat> we're about 50 people strong. And I've got an office in New York as well as uh, Tokyo. So we're, we're taking over the globe. We're not quite Google, but getting there. Uh, we specialize in developing new user interfaces and all kinds of new ways to access the internet. So I'll explain that in a second. Introduction. Um, not supposed to talk about the company too much, so I won't. <clears throat> what we don't do is we don't build websites. And I think a lot of the, the focus here today on interactivity and quote unquote you know, interaction has been about websites. It's been about Twitter. It's been about uh, you know, ways that people communicate ways that people communicate online. Uh, but what if you aren't online? You know, that's, that's actually sort of one of the things we solve. So basically, if you look at what we do, we don't build websites and we don't do anything that you can actually see from your desktop, um, which sounds kind of counterintuitive because it's like, well, what are these, they're digital. How do you do digital if it's nothing to do with a you know, computer? Um, well, what we do do is we build physical, interactive and immersive experiences on an unlimited scale with basically unlimited resolution. And I'll show you guys pictures of this later, but <clears throat> we feel that by immersing somebody in an environment or allowing somebody to interact physically with a display of some sort, uh, that message and brand is, is, is well, it's, more, it's better communicated and people understand it more. So getting someone to play with something, getting someone inside of an environment, um, we feel is a much more effective communication vehicle. And I will show you some pictures of how that works in a little bit. So why are we doing this? Um, <clears throat> three main reasons. One, it, which is pretty big, um, there's this keyboard mouse paradigm. Uh, one is really old, uh, which is the keyboard, which was invented in 1886. And one is the mouse, which is still really old. Uh, I think 1963 or something like that. You can Google it. But uh, <clears throat> both really, really antiquated ways to get information into this thing that is the center of basically all of our lives, the computer. Um, which of course hooks to the internet. So we're using these devices that you have to, you tethered to, to get information into this machine. And it's really, really old, so we're trying to get rid of that. Um, the second thing that we're trying to, trying to solve for is that once you get information in, it's trapped. A lot of people think it's free because it's on the internet. And some of, some of the talks earlier are about, oh, it's great, information is, is ubiquitous and there's zero cost on it, it's free, it's great, it's true. It's just that it's still trapped in this box and you still have to go like he's doing and you use this little old device that was invented on a typewriter and you put information into this thing and yeah, it's on the internet, but it's trapped there. There's no real way to get it out. I mean, you can use your mobile phone, but it's not quite getting there. Third problem and third thing we're trying to solve is that right now the only way that people view media is square and flat. So look around, you know, and I'm really bummed to be presenting on a PowerPoint on a flat screen, but <clears throat> you know, that's what we have. So, uh, but we feel that, that square and flat is not really the best way to experience information. And so we're changing that. And again, I'll show you how later. So this is a great picture here. Um, the guy, I think it's a movie screen from 1800. It literally looks like what we're doing right now. So nothing has changed in that field. And we're, uh, we're the guys out there trying to figure out how to change it. How are we changing it? Big question. Great question. Uh, I don't know. So here's what we're doing. So we're solving problems one, two, and three, and I'm going to walk you through kind of in a linear way. Um, <clears throat> we're developing new user inputs, and, and this is really important. It's the way that people interact with the screen. Um, so using 3D cameras, uh, laser, tra laser tracking systems, motion tracking systems, proximity sensors, sonar, radar, I mean, you name it, any new way, this, this new punch card thing, I don't know if you guys are familiar with punch cards, but they're awesome. I mean, everybody's using them, it's all the rage. Um, but those are new ways that you can get information into the computer. So giving the computer eyes, giving it ears, giving it you know, a sense of, not necessarily smell, but you can kind of fake smell. Um, so giving it all the senses a person can have through all these new user inputs. And what we focus is, is in the middle as well on our, uh, what we call our Fireframe suite. And it's a suite of products that enable us to um, access the internet through uh, XML APIs, a bunch of different ways uh, to get to this information that's on the internet, <clears throat> uh, building it, bringing that information out through an OpenGL framework. So we're not limited to um, information that goes on like a screen like that, uh, because we can put it basically anywhere. Um, if you start using OpenGL, we can render unlimited texture maps and basically, you know, 
take this entire room and turn it into a video uh, display. Um, <clears throat> as, as display technology increases and the, the, the SLI-enabled GPUs start coming out, it's even better. So you can start doing multiple GPU rendering. So we start getting into things like uh, you know, cinema and things like that that we can start building, uh, building information for. Uh, Real-time 3D engines, the gaming platforms, gaming engines that are out there, awesome. But again, they're all locked online, so we're bringing those guys out. And then, of course, you got mobile and all that stuff. But uh, the key to that is when you're processing this information via these new inputs, we can also then churn that information differently. And then you get really cool here in the outputs. So um, we've pioneered a lot of things in multi-touch. I don't know if you guys have seen a bunch of multi-touch interfaces, but I'll show you some in a minute. Um, immersive environments, again, we feel that, that, that message is better conveyed when someone can touch or interact or feel or, or be inside of a, uh, an environment. Um, malleable video displays, so video anywhere on any surface, so side of a building, skyscraper, inside of a dome, inside of a room, basically anywhere, um, going beyond the rectangle. And then um, <clears throat> we're just getting into 3D, which is pretty cool. Um, you know, avatars type stuff, but again, not on a flat, not on a square screen. And then this augmented reality concept where, you know, traditionally it's on your phone, you point, a, point it at a barcode or something cool, uh, and, uh, and all of a sudden you're getting information back, but we actually are augmenting true reality, and I'll show you how that works in a minute. So these are kind of the ways that, that we're looking at redefining the input paradigms, the, the processing paradigms, and then, of course, the output of information into your computer that will give you basically the internet anywhere. So what does it give you? Well, everything. Um, so from our standpoint, anything could become a website. And that's a big concept, is, is that the data, the information, commerce, advertising, everything that's trapped inside the web, we can bring out. And we can make it into an actionable item. So the surface of this table could become a website where I could buy a book from Amazon and have it downloaded to my Kindle when there's actually no website. It's just a table. Um, so what we're doing is pioneering, you know, the way that we can put the internet anywhere and then get it out of the box. So <clears throat> what, what am I talking about? That's a great question. Um, so let me just run through some things. I got a bunch of pretty pictures. I don't know how long I have, but I'll roll through some and tell you about them. I'm probably the, I don't, I don't know how many TED Talks have referenced Buckminster Fuller twice, but I'm going to be the second guy to reference Buckminster Fuller. <laughs> so... Um, <laughs> the first thing we do is we uh, immersive environments. We, we like to put people inside of, of environments. And we do this in a number of different ways, from rooms to domes to buildings to whatever. But let's look at some pictures. So here's a buckyball. Uh, these are one of our, our domes in, under construction that we'll build. So we can come in, uh, construct an immersive environment, and then turn it into something like this. This was a project we did for Trump where he needed to transport a bunch of people to Dubai. Not everybody wanted to go to Dubai. So we brought Dubai to New York City. And uh, we filmed in 360. We shot on a red camera with a hemispherical 220-degree Nikkor lens that actually went out and captured you know, 220 degrees, 360 of Dubai. So when you got inside the dome, you feel like you're in Dubai. Uh, this is uh, something we did for Google for Zeitgeist. More Donald Trump. So as you can start seeing a little bit of video. And this is what it looks inside. So what's going on here is... A uh, bunch of people having dinner, but as the environment around using six video projectors, no, this one is 90 feet. I think it's 11 video projectors that's, uh, that are stitched together with our software to create a full 360-degree video environment. And as the, the mood changed for dinner, the, the courses changed, the, the overall video changed. So it was a, kind of a cool uh, way to sort of visualize things. Then we took them on a trip through space. So... Yeah, uh, you know, basically a planetarium on steroids, but using some new technology, and of course, all being hooked back to the internet, driven from our office. This was the the Dubai thing. This is the the Palm Jumeirah, and uh, Donald Trump's new hotel and tower, which we think will get built. But uh, as you can see, it's you know a seamless video inside of a three hundred and sixty degree room. Uh, this is what it looks like inside. Bunch of water, neat stuff. We're integrating HD footage along the, around the top there. Bunch of uh, sheiks and things. Here's the big problem. What if you don't have a dome? It's an issue with some of you guys. <laughs> I've had a couple of you have one, but maybe not everybody. So if you don't have one, what do you do? Well, that's fine. <clears throat> In the old days, ye olden days, 
Um, you just needed a space, right? You, you needed a guy who knew how to paint in a space. So it's something like the Sistine Chapel. Well, we can take existing spaces, and uh, we have some guys, and we can do things like this at Carnegie Hall. And I don't have any video of this, but it was really, really stunning. This is uh, Wagner's Ride of the Valkyrie, where these horses came trampling, uh, you know, basically out of the background, across the entire stage, and out through the audience. So transforming Carnegie Hall in concert with Michael Tilson Thomas and the YouTube Symphony Orchestra into a, you know, basically a giant video display. Uh, these are uh, basically the, the real-time internet feeds. So as we went out and pulled the YouTube videos of the people that were actually in the audience or in the, the symphony, those are coming off of YouTube. So we're integrating the internet into the physical environment. Uh, if you don't have Carnegie Hall, which most people don't, um, a lot of times you can get a neighborhood. So this is a neighborhood that we did where you can see up on the... Up on the roofs, we've got a bunch of 30,000 lumen projectors, and we did about 14 buildings all in conjunction with each other. So the whole neighborhood became an extension of the Internet. All of this content was being pulled off of the iGoogle uh, website, so all their iGoogle themes were now making up the art for these buildings. Uh, another picture looking down. Uh, uh, that's a Gansevoort Hotel on your left. Expensive but nice. Uh, it's Pastis, also expensive but nice. Um, so if you don't have a, a neighborhood that's, you know, accessible to the public, you can do one of the private. This is uh, a job we did over in the Middle East where we took an entire uh, subdivision and turned it into a big dynamic video environment. So all of this, everything you see here is uh, video projections being perfectly mapped back to the buildings. If you happen to have a skyscraper laying around, we can do that too. <clears throat> this is over in Seoul. Um, so uh, we can take a video, map it back to the skyscraper, and then uh, have cell phone images being either produced on it. You could come down there and text into it and say, here's a picture of my kids. Goes out over the internet. Picture gets processed. Text message comes back to you. Says, oh, come down at 315 and you'll see your kid. So people could you know, gather around, basically come see their pictures of their kids or their text messages. And anyway, everything here is driven, again, back off the internet. So extending that internet into the real physical world. Uh, another picture of that. Uh, this is an IMP structure up in uh, Novato that we turned into some kind of, uh, well, I don't know what it was, but it was, it was pretty cool. <clears throat> uh, biggest problem, I guess, if you don't have a building. So we're getting down to the lowest common denominator. You don't have Carnegie Hall. You don't have a neighborhood. You don't have a dome. Um, that's fine. We can take your car. So here we're doing things for Saturn where we're actually turning the car into the display. So this is all being driven off real time. Um, these touch screens that you can touch and the car sort of melts away. The body panels disappear. Uh, you can see how the hybrid system works and the regenerative braking system and all kinds of kinds of neat things about the car, um, using it itself as a display. Another, uh, another vehicle we did for fine General Motors. This is neat, this is one of our pool tables. So this is basically uh, an application we wrote, does similar things, it, it basically is tracking balls in real time and then does a, a reveal. Uh, I don't know if I can do that one again, but it's neat. This is at the Esquire house and uh, it's for sale on our website, so come down and check it out. <laughs> it's not as easy as it looks. Um, so that's sort of the, the picture of the reveal on it. Uh, this is something also we did for Kodak recently. This is taking all of their imagery and all of their information about their digital cameras and allowing multiple people on uh, this multi-touch table to come up and interact with it. So as they're looking at the imagery, they can take a you know, pick the camera they want, push the button, scale, zoom, rotate, whatever, and they can actually get all, drill down to all the information they need, all based off of what the information's on their website. Uh, multi-touch display, giant multi-touch displays, taking conf concert or conference information. Uh, this is a collaborative symphony where people can actually come up and multiple people can create music uh, based upon a multi-touch display. Uh, if you don't have a display, you don't have a house, you don't have anything, you can also just do it in the air. So uh, this is what we call our Vision Air product, and we're just basically using motion tracking to track a multi-touch display that's projected back onto a holographic screen. Uh, pretty neat. Uh, this is a, something we did for Adobe, where as you walk by this display, you can interact with it, and the more you physically move, the more it moves. 
and the more it does stuff on the web. And the kids love it. <clears throat> uh, Intel, multi-touch, more multi-touch. Oh, this is neat. These are holographic panels we build that uh, allow a presenter to drive uh, a display, and then it's mirrored back up to any number of displays. So we can actually go through real-time 3D modeling. We've written a real-time 3D modeling software that enables us to take in AutoCAD models or whatever and display them back on any surface. Um, mirrors, so you walk up to it, takes your picture, does some feedback, projects mirrors back on you, turns into a girl. Um, so large multi-touch display we did, and I think well, maybe that's it. <laughs> 